welcome everybody. And you know, it's our pleasure to, to have Katie Salvador here today. She is a graduate of Springfield College for undergrad and for PA school. And she is certified. Uh, she works in our Middletown Clinic and um, helps treat a, a lot of folks with anxiety and addiction. So it's a pleasure to have her and I'll turn it over to you, Katie. All right, cool. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Podolsky. Um, like you said, my name is Katie. Most of you know me from working at the Middletown Clinic. Um, I am going to talk to you today about anxiety and addiction. I have to tell you, I'm no expert on this subject, but I have been working in the mental health and addiction field for a few years now, and this is a really common overlap. So I'm hoping that I can share some clinical experiences and just kind of a review of the literature and the guidelines that are out there right now. All right, so just an overview of the lecture today. Um, we're gonna be talking about the co-occurrence of anxiety disorders and substance use disorders, the vicious cycle of comorbidity between the two disorders, sometimes referred to as the mutual maintenance pattern, and the proposed risk factors for development of both disorders, the treatment of comorbid anxiety and substance use disorders, and we'll talk a little bit about benzodiazepines. Okay, so here are some statistics. 17 to 18% of people with a substance use disorder and the general population also have an anxiety disorder. That comes out to about a third of people who are in treatment. Um, decades of research show that substance use disorder and anxiety disorders co-occur at a greater rate than would be expected just by chance alone. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and how they overlap and maybe how one feeds into the other. Um, it's important to know the presence of an anxiety disorder or substance use disorder is also a risk factor for the other disorder. The more severe the substance use disorder, the more prevalent the anxiety disorder. So the more severe someone has a substance use disorder, they're more likely to also have a co-occurring anxiety disorder. And anxiety disorders are more prevalent in drug use disorders compared to alcohol use disorders. Um, this percentage at the top, the 17 to 18%, we are talking about anxiety disorders in the DSM-5. So I think this number would be much, much bigger if we were including PTSD and OCD um, that were kind of considered to be an anxiety disorder in the previous DSMs. Um, I think it would be tremendously, tremendously higher. So just keep that in mind. We're talking about generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, um, mostly when we're talking about anxiety disorders here. Um, anxiety is a very common motive for using substances. It's a trigger for relapse. It exacerbates withdrawal and can lead to worse functioning and worse quality of life. Substance use, substance-induced anxiety disorders. I just wanted to point out that most of this lecture will be talking about anxiety disorders that meet DSM criteria, but I think everyone can think of patients that they've had where anxiety is actually just a result of the substances that you're using, maybe because of withdrawal, um, but that's different from somebody having a full syndrome. So substance-induced anxiety disorders are actually quite rare. About one to 2% of anxiety disorders are actually substance-induced. Um, anxiety symptoms are common with substance use, but they often remit following periods of abstinence. So it's important to differentiate between the two. Does this person actually have an anxiety disorder that meets the full criteria? So for example, with generalized anxiety disorder, that would be at least six months of symptoms. Um, or was this just a little bit of anxiety that was occurring after the patient went to detox and a little bit of a post-acute withdrawal state? If somebody is meeting a full syndrome, it's probably an independent anxiety disorder. And that's mostly what we're gonna be talking about today, the overlap between full anxiety disorders and substance use disorders. So just to highlight anxiety and opioid use disorder, um, I know opioid use disorder is very commonly treated here at the root centers, what we are mostly dealing with on our day to day. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that it's one of the substance use disorders where anxiety is the most severe and most common. 60% um, of people with an opioid use disorder will have an anxiety dis will have an anxiety disorder. People with anxiety disorder are more likely to be prescribed opioids, so it kind of puts them at risk for 
initiating that process of a substance use disorder perhaps, and they have a higher risk of development for an opioid use disorder. Typically, anxiety will proce precede opioid use. It's one of the most common reasons we hear people saying that they are still using to self-medicate, to treat their anxiety, to feel better. With alcohol use disorder, um, I found that one in five individuals with anxiety report using alcohol to cope with stress, and 20% of people diagnosed with an alcohol or substance use disorder also suffer from anxiety. I don't know what you guys think, but that number does seem kind of low to me. Um, I'm not sure, maybe it's because we see a lot more people with opioid use disorder coming into treatment because it is so, it has such a devastating effect on their life that most people with an opioid use disorder at some point are seeking services and mental health services also to address their anxiety. Whereas maybe people with an alcohol use disorder aren't coming into treatment as often or reporting their anxiety because um, many people with an alcohol use disorder can still function. Many people with an alcohol use disorder don't think it's a problem. Um, so I'm wondering if that's kind of where, why that number seems low. Again, it's just a guess that could be accurate. Um, a lot of the literature on anxiety and alcohol use disorders surrounds social anxiety and panic disorder. Panic disorder typically has a large association with alcohol use disorder. There is, interestingly enough, more research on anxiety and alcohol use disorder, especially with those two, panic and social anxiety, than there are with substance use disorders at this point. Um, the research does seem to be in its infancy, um, so I hope that more studies will come to light in the coming years. So it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, I think we can all see clearly why anxiety and substance use disorders kind of go together. But if you actually zoom out and think about the two disorders, you know, behaviorally and what kind of personality traits might put someone at risk for developing one or both of these disorders, when you think about it on a spectrum, um, kind of sits on opposite ends. Like maybe somebody with anxiety is not much of a risk taker. And you can think of somebody with a substance use disorder, maybe being a little bit more of a risk taker, thrill seeker. Um, and then when you think about punishment sensitivity, if you think about someone with anxiety, like they're overgeneralizing the consequence or the punishment. So somebody got into a car accident when it was raining maybe 10 years ago, and now they will never drive in the rain again because they are so worried that driving in the rain leads to a car accident. Whereas somebody on the with substance use disorder might be kind of at the opposite side of the spectrum. They keep suffering all these consequences and all these consequences and maybe not even realizing that it is a problem. So I think that it is kind of a curious combination sometimes that somebody could have both. Um, but let's get into why it's actually probably more common than you would think. Um, why do people use drugs? For reward or for relief or both? Um, and the relief part here, wanting to feel relief, I think is really where these two disorders start to overlap, anxiety and substance use disorders. People want to feel less bad. So they're using substances to medicate their anxiety and so on. Um, the more, the worse the distress, the relief will likely be more reinforcing. So somebody who's having severe levels of anxiety or stress probably is getting more of a relief from using a substance like an opiate or alcohol or a benzo than somebody in less distress, if that makes sense. So it's more rewarding to them, which makes them want to maybe seek out substances more often. This is um, data published last year from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health regarding the most common reason for last opioid use. And I think it's interesting if you look, four out of the top five reasons were for the purpose of relief rather than reward. So pain relief, to relax or feel less anxious for sleep, for emotion relief. Um, and I think relief of withdrawal could really come into play here too when you're thinking about relief and the reason for using substances. Desire for relief is a trem tremendous motivator for substance use. So we can see that these disorders overlap quite frequently. Um, and there has been a lot of speculation as to why that is. There's one 
lead to the other or vice versa? Or is it more that somebody has certain risk factors that put them at risk for both disorders? So the first pathway is a self-medication pathway. And that states that people consume alcohol and illicit substances to cope with anxiety disorders. And then the substance-induced pathway states that substance use leads to increased anxiety and a vulnerability for co-occurring anxiety disorders. The common factor model uses the third variable to explain why somebody might be at risk for developing both disorders at once. Um, this, the question of how anxiety and alcohol or any substance use disorder, um, why they coalesce and overlap and interplay has definitely been a topic of research for decades. Um, like I said, still not a lot of great research. I'll kind of go over a few of the studies here and there with certain treatments. Um, but at this point, we don't actually know which one of these pathways. The data supports all three models. Um, people can come into having both of these disorders from several different pathways at once, um, regardless of the course through which anxiety and substance use disorder coalesce the pathways together lead to a mutual maintenance pattern where each disorder ends up perpetuating the other. So this is a self-medication pathway. Um, you can just see it shows somebody has an anxiety disorder, leads to substance use where they can get that short-term relief, they continue to use, and then they develop consequences from using substances, and then that in turn increases their anxiety. So that's the self-medication pathway that starts with the anxiety disorder. This is a substance-induced pathway. You can see someone's using substances. They're having a heightened stress re response. Also an increase in their own life stressors and consequences is causing more anxiety and then that anxiety is causing more substance use. So again, we're coming full circle. Both disorders are interplaying with each other. The common risk factor model um, states that not one disorder necessarily leads to another, but that there might be certain risk factors that could put somebody at risk for having both. Um, and some examples of those that we can get into is family history and genetics, anxiety sensitivity, and a history of trauma. So anxiety sensitivity, there is this thought that there are certain people out there for whom relief is actually feels more rewarding. And that may be for a population of people who have something we call anxiety sensitivity or distress intolerance. Um, so this is the tendency to react with fear to anxiety related sensations. The inability to tolerate the stressing psychological or physiological straits are implicated in the comorbidity between anxiety and substance use disorders. So people who have distress about their own distress um, are more at risk for having a substance use disorder. So people who become anxious and they just wanna get out of it, they say, I just don't wanna be in my body, get me out of this, make it stop. And they're looking to do anything to make it stop. Somebody like that is more at risk for turning to substances to treat their anxiety. Um, anxiety sensitivity is associated with increased opioid misuse among adults with chronic pain. That was according to new research in the American Journal of Drug and Alcohol Abuse. Um, so having anxiety in response to your anxiety increases your motivation to want to use. People want a quick fix behavior, um, even if it comes with later consequences. So having somebody who has anxiety sensitivity, I'm sure we have all come across them in our practice, um, probably has more of a risk of relapse or continued substance use. Um, this is one of my favorite topics. I love this study, the ACE study focused on adverse childhood events. Um, it was a report that came out of Kaiser and the CDC in 2007. It was one of the largest investigations of childhood abuse, neglect, and household challenges that lead to later life health and well-being problems. Um, it was a 10 question survey. Almost two thirds of study participants reported at least one ACE and more than one in five reported three or more ACEs. So the 10 question survey was based off of, you can see in this picture, um, items from abuse, neglect, or household dysfunction, um, all based on what might've happened to someone growing up in their house under the age of 18. So you're given a score for each one ACE category that you experience. So 
maybe some that would be more obvious to us would be physical, emotional, sexual abuse or neglect, physical or emotional neglect. But also um, many of the factors were whether you had an incarcerated parent, if, you, if your parent suffered divorce, if somebody in your home was using substances, or if you witnessed your mother being treated violently, that would give you one score on the ACE study. So what they found is that people who experienced a score of four or higher um, had a higher risk of developing all sorts of diseases. Interestingly enough, including asthma, heart attacks, early death, um, and maybe more obvious to us would be mental illness, including depression, anxiety, suicide, and PTSD. Also, individuals who experience at least one traumatic event in their childhood are four times more likely to suffer from drug and alcohol dependence later in life. So to me, this maybe is an obvious risk factor. If somebody has a higher ACE score, probably is going to put them at risk for both having a substance use disorder and an anxiety disorder. Um, so when we're talking about shared risk factors, I think it's important to think about adverse childhood events. Um, I think everyone should take this survey. Like I said, it's just 10 questions and it might give you a better understanding of why you perceive the world the way that you do. All right. So clinical implications of alcohol, um, substance use disorders and anxiety disorders. So comorbid anxiety disorders and substance use disorders can impact the course and treatment, and treatment outcome for the counterpart condition. Studies have shown that anxiety disorders are related to an increased severity of lifetime alcohol use disorders, increased lifetime service utilization, so more people looking for treatment and services, and increased severity of alcohol withdrawal and higher relapse rates following substance abuse treatment. Alternatively, the presence of a substance use disorder can also impact the course of an anxiety disorder. Um, one 12 year perspective study showed that the presence of a substance use disorder decreased the recovery rate and increased the likelihood of recurrence of generalized anxiety disorder. So with treatment considerations, um, there's been several different hypotheses. Should we treat both of these disorders exactly at the same time? Should we treat one before the other? Um, the answer to that, I think is still unknown. It's largely based on expert opinion. I think it's really intuitive, the answer for all of us to think that we should treat both at the same time. Um, and that may be kind of a newer opinion. I'm sure you've heard of patients who have gone to psychiatrists or other doctors who are still using, maybe they're still using fentanyl, but they go looking for help for their anxiety. And the doctor tells them, oh, we can't do anything about it yet. We need, you have to stop using first. And I think that was kind of more common back in the day. I think we've gotten away from that a little bit. We've been a little bit more aggressive of treating both conditions at once. And that is the recommendation right now. Um, if the patient is significantly more ready to change one of, this, one of the disorders as compared to the other, they recommend starting treatment for that. And then when they're ready to address the other using motivational interviewing to improve the readiness to change. Um, So unfortunately, like I said, very few studies have been done to validate the need for the integrated approach, but it does seem intuitive at this time. And talking about treatment, um, medication-wise, again, very little research. Most research in this area has focused on alcohol use disorder with social anxiety disorder. So we can kind of take some findings from there and hypothesize that it might work for other substance use disorders as well. Um, SSRIs are maybe the safest and most widely used agents to treat anxiety disorders, um, along with SNRIs. They are generally first-line treatment, especially for patients with substance use disorders, alcohol use disorders, um, because they are safe. They're well-tolerated. They don't have much abuse potential. Um, in contrast to other types of antidepressants like TCAs, you do not interact with alcohol or cause respiratory depression. There was a study done on Paxil. Um, it was evaluated as a treatment for social anxiety disorder and alcohol use disorder when they occur concurrently. And the study showed that Paxil improved social anxiety disorder compared to placebo 
and lowered clinical global rates of alcohol severity. This study was followed by a larger study where the authors reported that Paxil did not decrease alcohol use, but it did decrease reliance on alcohol to engage in social situations. So I think it's promising to consider Paxil. Um, there's also a study done on Boost Bar in a 12 week double blind placebo controlled trial of 61 alcohol dependent individuals with anxiety. Boost Bar was shown to increase retention and treatment and reduce anxiety resulting in a slower return to heavy drinking and fewer drinking days in the follow-up period. Topamax um, has been shown to have some promise in the treatment of alcohol dependence um, and alcohol cravings, so reducing relapse to alcohol. It's right now, it's still considered off-label. There's not much evidence behind it at this point, um, but also has shown to have some efficacy in the treatment of social anxiety disorder, so it could be considered for patients with both. Um, gabapentin, some studies show that gabapentin is efficacious in promoting abstinence and reducing drinking in individuals with alcohol use disorder, especially with alcohol withdrawal symptoms. So it's important to note that gabapentin is not um, first line treatment for alcohol withdrawal. It will not prevent somebody from having a seizure. But in the treatment of long-term alcohol use disorder, I think it's something that more research is going to be done on. We can really consider it more. I know we use it a lot off label. Um, for example, for somebody who has been to alcohol detox and they're coming out still having a little bit of post acute withdrawal symptoms, um, also suffering a little bit of anxiety and cravings for alcohol. I do use gabapentin a little bit off label in that population. Um, again, we'll kind of see what comes out in the future, but I do think it's something to consider with patients who have alcohol use disorder and anxiety, I think it could be a good choice. So benzodiazepines, um, can't give a lecture about anxiety and, benzo and addiction without talking about benzodiazepines. Um, we hear about them all the time. They're treatment for anxiety, for insomnia, for alcohol withdrawal. Prescriptions for benzodiazepine are very common. Um, more than one in 20 people in the U.S. have a benzo prescription, and this has increased in number 140 percent um, from 2000, from 1990 to 2013. Um, and that is the number of prescriptions that were prescribed and the potency of those prescriptions. Some data suggests that they can be prescribed safely in substance use disorders. Some data suggest it can be risky. Right now, we're lacking really good evidence on that. This is um, data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. This is from 2019, looking at past year illicit drug use. Um, this was really surprising to me to see that benzodiazepines, they're in the category of tranquilizer or sedative misuse. They're not the only ones in that category. That does include barbiturates and the Z drugs. But it was very surprising to see that that was in the top three. That was before cocaine use. Um, and that is something that has been trending up over the years. So I think the trending up is concerning, something we need to monitor more. So who is at risk for developing a benzodiazepine if you're a sedative use disorder? Um, people with substance use disorders, they're more likely than the general population to be prescribed a benzodiazepine in the first place. Um, the majority of people report using illicit benzos to cope with their anxiety. 70% of patients with opioid use disorder reported misusing a benzo in their lifetime, and 25% of patients with alcohol use disorder reported misusing a benzo in their lifetime. That is much, um, that is much higher than the general population. People who are already, who already have a substance use disorder typically will combine benzos with the other substance to almost boost the euphoric effects. I think we hear that a lot with our patients with opioid use disorder um, at the clinics. What is very concerning about the combination of benzos and other substances is that it has been a huge contributor to opioid related deaths. Um, so 30% of opioid overdose deaths involved a benzodiazepine in 2019. 70 to 75% of people with an opioid use disorder reported lifetime benzodiazepine misuse. Um, this is tremendously concerning. 
I think when we're considering benzos for the treatment of anxiety for people with an opioid use disorder, this is one of the most important things to consider. Are we increasing this person's risk for overdose? And the data suggests that yes, that is a possibility. Um, drug overdose deaths involving benzos rose from 1,135 in 1999 to 11,537 in 2017. That increased more than tenfold between 1996 and 2016. There was a little bit of a drop between 2017 and 2019, where the deaths declined to 9,711. I also wanted to bring up gabapentin um, when talking about this topic. Um, gabapentin's effects on the central nervous system can include drowsiness um, and low-level euphoria. It's been recognized within the addiction community to enhance the euphoric effects of heroin. So a lot of people are combining gabapentin and fentanyl or heroin, the same way that we talked about with benzos to kind of boost the euphoria. Um, a study in 2016 found that gabapentin misuse was only 1% among the general population. However, for those that misuse opioids, gabapentin misuse significantly increased to 15 to 22%. Um, so in an effort for providers to reduce opioid abuse, um, they began prescribing more gabapentin for pain, um, thinking that this was a safer alternative. And overall it is, um, but they found that during 2013 to 2017, 74,175 gabapentin exposures were reported to poison control centers. And a clear correlation was documented that the increase of accessibility to gabapentin directly increased toxic exposures. Um, so I think that's important to consider when you have somebody with anxiety disorder, it can often be very difficult to treat if they also have an opioid use disorder. Um, Cause I think everybody's main concern would be staying away from benzos. And you wanna feel like you're meeting the patient halfway. Um, a lot of patients will ask for gabapentin, but I think even just given this data from 2016, it's risky to prescribe somebody gabapentin if they're actively using fentanyl or heroin because of the increased overdose risk especially because gabapentin for anxiety is not, it's not FDA approved, it's still considered off-label. Um, so that is, it's hard. I'm faced with that all the time with our patients. You know, they want to be prescribed a benzo, um, but we want to keep them safe from that. So then they'll ask about gabapentin and you want to feel like you're meeting them halfway, but it is, I think this is really important to consider. And I don't know how well known this is. Um, this was obviously data from 2016. I haven't really found anything that's more recent, but I still think that this is really important to consider. All right, and the last leg of the treatment obviously is behavioral treatment, which is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, I'm not an expert on the behavioral treatments as a PA, but I just wanted to highlight that CBD is probably the biggest platform to use for somebody with substance use disorder and anxiety disorder. So they're shown to be infective for both. Um, the CBT approach to anxiety consists of two strategies, anxiety management techniques, such as cognitive restructuring, applied relaxation and coping skills training and exposure to fear stimuli, to feared stimuli. Um, a little bit of a tidbit on that. I think it's been a concern in the mental health world that exposure to feared stimuli during CB. Sorry, I just realized I wrote CBD. Obviously I meant to write CBT guys, sorry. <laughs> and I think I'm saying CBD because I'm looking at it. But CBT, um, people are concerned that if somebody is doing exposure to feared stimuli, does that increase their risk for relapse because they are not ready, they can't handle it. They're just gonna go home after the exposure and start drinking or have a relapse to drug use. Um, and I think that's a really reasonable thing to consider, but there's absolutely no evidence for that. There's no hard data saying that um, there would be an increased relapse risk with exposure-based treatment. And it brings up a topic of, are we limiting good anxiety treatments for patients with substance use disorders? All right, that's it. Does anybody have any questions?
Um, another question. You were talking about panic disorder and social anxiety disorder, um, and they're large in the population of AUD. But you said that anxiety and SUD, they have like opposite, like risk taking and the punishment sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Like, what do you think that correlates to? Like, why are those co occurring if they're like so opposite? I think it's the relief. Like, relief is such a tremendous motivator for alcohol use and substance use. So, somebody suffering from social anxiety, especially when you think about alcohol. Um, they go to a party yeah. and they're going to be there and they're anxious, so they're drinking. Um, same thing with panic disorder. If somebody develops panic symptoms, um, they just want that feeling to go away. Very likely to turn to substance use for relief. I think the, yeah. I think the message is that the, the wanting relief for most people can outweigh the first kind of the personality trait of being less risk taking, mm -hmm. less, you know sensation seeking. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Katie, is there any evidence on like, um, first of all, great presentation was like super useful for all of us, I'm sure. Um, but is there any evidence on kind of like for refractory treatment? I feel like in substance use disorder, like so many times, like they've tried, you know, every SSRI or they, you know, they can't, their side effects and they're all kind of similar, you know, benzos aren't ideal, gabapentin maybe doesn't work, like just refractory treatment. Um, has pregabalin, is there like Lyric, is there any evidence like as that's kind of closely related to gabapentin that that's like effective at all or just outside of that even? Like what's the next step when there's just really nothing working? Yeah, unfortunately we face that all the time. Um, we have a lot of our patients with those, they don't want to take an SSRI because it causes, it just hasn't worked in the past or it causes side effects. Um, benzos are off the table because they have an opioid use disorder. We've tried gabapentin, it doesn't work. Um, I have not, I did not specifically look into research for Lyrica. I think that's a good point. Um, I know that it's similar to gabapentin, I think, in its abuse potential and its risk for respiratory depression. So I think it probably would be, would still want to be pretty cautious, especially in people with opioid use disorders. Um, right now, it doesn't have an indication for anxiety. I've had patients ask for it before. They'll say, the gabapentin doesn't feel strong enough. Can I try Lyrica? Um, I have not gone there yet. I have heard of it happening out in the community. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I wish I had more hard research for you on that. No worries. Does yeah. anybody? Yeah. And Chris and, and Katie, I don't have any hardcore research for you, but I do know um, oftentimes we use blood pressure medications to mitigate yeah. some of the um, somatic effects of anxiety, like um, tachycardia or hypertension. So um, beta blockers are common. Prazosin, um, other you know alpha adrenergic agents are helpful for for the somatic component, and then for the mental component, sometimes we use atypical antipsychotics. Um, like Seroquel, Abilify, those, you know, those types of medications, uh, but they have a whole host of additional side effects. So it, it gets complicated at that point, but um, if you're already down, um, you know, so many different trials and options, you know, it's something that patients are willing to consider. So I'll just throw that out there. And I know um, Katie's been doing some of this too, probably. Um, we don't mm -hmm. like to, to have to go to that level, but sometimes it's necessary. So I don't, does that answer or at least partially answer your? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you, Katie. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, if anyone has any further questions, I think they can reach out. Um, is there anything in chat that, that we missed here? Oh, 
Yeah, if we could share the list of resources, is that something we can do, Katie? Yes. Perfect. All right, well, thank you everybody. I guess we'll conclude here um, and we'll see you next month.